There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain. All sufficient sacrifice, so freely given, such a price. But our redemption, heaven's gates swing wide. All sufficient sacrifice, so freely given, such a price. But our redemption, heaven's Good morning, River Church community. I'm so glad you could join us for our online gathering this week. This last week, I went to the first concert I've been to since before the pandemic. I was so excited. Someone got me tickets to see John Mayer for my birthday, and he was definitely on my bucket list of people I wanted to see live. And with artists like John Mayer who have been releasing music for a really long time. When you go to their concert, you never know what they're going to play and you're hoping that they play some of your favorite songs, even if they're older. And so at the concert, I was really excited because he played one of my favorite songs from his older albums. And I'm the kind of person at a concert that likes to sing and dance and just enjoy the music. So when this song came on, I was singing along and there were a couple people in front of me who started clapping. So I started clapping and in my mind, we were all clapping. <laughs> in my mind, everyone was enjoying the song and moving to the rhythm. And then at near the end of the song, the person that I went to the concert with leaned over and said, you realize only like 
three people are clapping. <laughs> Which was so funny to me because I really, it, it really felt like everybody was clapping and I, I just didn't think about it. And I almost immediately thought, isn't that kind of how worship is sometimes at church? I know that there are people based on your experience and your personality who may feel totally comfortable being the only one clapping or being the only one dancing. And then I also know that many of us have probably had an experience in which we're in worship and it, it feels a bit awkward and a little self-conscious. Like maybe we want to stand up, but no one else is standing. So we're not really sure what to do or people start raising their hands and, and should we raise our hands and, and why do we do that? And so we're doing a series in the month of November on worship to help refresh our understanding of what it is and our, our vision of, of why it is that we are doing this. So we're going to dive into a passage, a passage in the Bible that has inspired my vision of worship. But before we do that, let me say a prayer for us. Well, God, I, I ask that you would meet each one of us this morning, every person that is watching the stream, that you would be close to them and they would feel your presence, that um, you would use this message in, in a way that maybe they need to hear this morning, that you would speak to their hearts. And I pray those things in your name, Jesus. Amen. So we're going to be in the book of Acts in chapter 16. The book of Acts tells the story of the early church, the followers of Jesus after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so we are in chapter 16, starting with verse 16. It says, once we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he threw his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Okay, there is a lot we could unpack in this passage. And it's helpful to know that Paul and Silas are going around and doing the work of Jesus, doing what Jesus did and teaching about his death and resurrection. And that's, that's what they're doing in this passage. There is a female slave who has a spirit that allows her to tell the future. And because of that, she's being trafficked. And so when they free her from the spirit and she's no longer able to fortune tell, well, the people who are making money off of her are losing money. And so they have Paul and Silas thrown in prison. 
Now, again, there's a lot we could unpack in this passage, but something strikes me. Paul and Silas are thrown into prison for doing something good, for doing Jesus' work. They're thrown into prison, and at midnight, they are praying and singing. They are singing hymns to God. I can tell you if it were me, I would probably not feel like singing. Um, Praying, I could definitely see me doing that. Uh, Having a panic attack, probably. A breakdown, definitely. Singing? I don't know about singing, and I just imagine the people listening to them. I mean, it's midnight. There's probably someone who's like, hey, be quiet. I'm trying to sleep over here. Have you ever witnessed someone responding to something that is stressful or really difficult in such a way that it it reveals something beautiful about their character or their heart or their faith, maturity? A while ago, I remember I had a friend who texted me and said that they were going into a meeting in which they were going to be told that they were laid off and they are really good at their job and they love their job. And they said, please pray that I would continue to reflect Christ and that I would trust in God's goodness that hasn't failed me yet. And I remember being so moved by their prayer. Because, again, if it were me, I probably would have texted a few friends and said, please pray that I don't have a breakdown and completely embarrass myself and that I find a new job quickly. Both of which would, I think would have been reasonable. But her response showed something about God's goodness and her character. And in the same way, their response in prison, it intrigues me. I think it's important to understand that in their context, I mean, I don't want to be in prison in any context, but in their context, they are, their feet are in stocks. So they're sitting up, they're not sleeping. And it would have been like trying to sleep sitting up on cement. Like who wants to do that? I doubt that they've been fed. There's no sunlight where they are. And they're singing. In that situation, would you feel like singing praises to God? When it comes to worship, I, in my experience, we can approach worship in this way. Like God does something. God does something for us. God responds to a need. We are reminded of God's goodness. And so we respond in worship. And what can happen with that kind of posture and approach and understanding of worship is that we only worship then when we feel like it. Like what happens when God isn't showing up for us? What happens when we haven't felt God's goodness in a really long time? Then do we not worship? I appreciate the way that Eugene Peterson has written about this. Uh, Eugene Peterson was a pastor uh, for a long time and an author who wrote a number of books about following Jesus. And he wrote this, if Christians worshiped only when they felt like it, there would be precious little worship. We think that if we don't feel something, there can be no authenticity in doing it. But the wisdom of God says something different, that we can act ourselves into a new way of feeling much quicker than we can feel ourselves into a new way of acting. Worship is an act that develops feelings for God, not a feeling for God that is expressed in an act of worship. Worship is an act that develops feelings for God, not a feeling for God that is expressed in an act of worship. Many of you may know that I've had a long journey with chronic illness. And in a particular season that was very difficult with my health, part of the challenge of that season was it also felt like God was absent, like God didn't care, like God wasn't doing anything. And I remember during that time I had a conversation with a friend of mine 
who went on a week-long retreat and fasted almost the entire time. And she came out of the retreat, and in the phone call she said, Wow, Grace, I am so encouraged. God really lifted up my heart. God spoke to me. God met me. God gave me vision. This is exactly what I needed. She was on like a spiritual high, which can happen when you fast. Sometimes when we fast from something, it's like we get to feast on the presence of God. And that was what I really wanted. And that was what I felt like I really needed. And so I said to her, maybe I should do like a long fast. And my friend in her wisdom and with grace said, "Um, you know, I think you should think that one through. Maybe you should talk to God about it because grace, you're already in a desert season. Like you kind of are fasting unintentionally because of what your life is like right now. And so I listened to her. I had a conversation with God, like God was right there. And I just put it before God and I said, God, what would you have me do? I... I want to be closer to you. I want to move your heart. Uh, Should I fast? Like, what will bring me closer to you? And I had a strong sense that God responded. And it was because it both resonated with me and it was not what I wanted to hear. You ever wish God was just kind of more like a magic eight ball? You could, you know, if you got an answer you didn't like, you could just shake it up a little bit and, and get something else. Well, God said, Grace, you know what really moves my heart? What I delight in is when you play and sing worship songs on your ukulele, even when you don't feel like it. And honestly, I would have rather fasted. (laughs) I would have rather fasted. I didn't want to sing songs about how God was making a way because God wasn't making a way for me. I didn't want to sing a song about how God was always faithful because it didn't feel like God was always faithful faithful. It didn't feel authentic to sing that. And so in a way, it felt like I was dragging my soul out of bed to praise the Lord. Anyone relate? Like, come on. And I I started to play some songs. And what I found was that the singing actually became, became a kind of strength. It became a kind of strength. I didn't feel strong, but but the singing was giving me a kind of strength. And, you know, I read in a book about the early church, you know, the early church followers of Jesus, they lived hard lives. They were being persecuted because they were followers of Jesus. They were largely misunderstood. And they claimed that through their worship ser- worship services, God not only changed them, but strengthened them to face the daunting problems daily living. The singing became my strength. But not only that, I started listening to more songs that came from communities who had endured relentless suffering, far worse than mine. And I started to feel like, well, if they have a song, I can have a song. And maybe if I don't have a song right now, I'll just borrow their song. And it was like I was borrowing their song in a way that felt like solidarity. Like I was I was entering in to an assembly of people who were singing praises and crying out to God. Willie Jennings said it this way. Praying and singing are acts of joining that weave our voices and words with the desperate of this world who cry out to God day and night. Each time we pray and sing, we are also joined to the shouts of joy and praise to a God who saves and delivers and invites us to take hold of divine power by faith. In praying and singing, we join our voices in a way that not only gives us strength, but solidarity. Maybe today you don't feel like you have a song to sing. Like to try and praise God would be like dragging your soul out of bed. Come on. And I also wonder if if singing in community, you might be able to sort of ride the coattails of someone else's faith, borrow their song. 
and find strength and solidarity in that. And maybe today, if you do have a song to sing, let me encourage you to sing it out. That someone else might be encouraged. That someone else might be able to borrow it. I think it's it's great if we respond to God's goodness with praise. I think it's great if when God moves in a way in our life, when God encourages us, when we're reflecting on what God has done, that we respond in praise. That's good. But if we only worship when we feel like it, well, we're missing out. We're missing out on the presence of God that can give us strength and solidarity to face whatever it is that's coming our way in life. See, I think we often imagine that worship is a response to God's goodness, but it works the other way too, that when we worship, we are drawn into God's presence and goodness. The Spirit of God, which gives us strength. Now, I also want to mention that I do think there was something else that contributed to Paul and Silas's response in prison, their ability to sing. I think it was something beyond a kind of commitment and discipline to doing it, which is what I'm describing. See, their life, their whole purpose was defined by the life of Jesus. We know from the writings of Paul, he wrote, a number of letters that are recorded in the second half of your Bible, we know that he wanted to be like Jesus. He wanted his life to look like the trajectory of Jesus's life. And it's really interesting that this storyline, the way that they are stripped, the way that they are accused and then stripped and beaten and thrown into prison, it looks a lot like Jesus's story. And so there is a kind of solidarity that they are experiencing with Jesus for sure. And on top of that, they lived so close to the resurrection of Jesus that it granted them a kind of freedom. Because what power did anyone have over them? They knew that Jesus resurrected from the dead. And so what was the worst What was the worst that people could do to them? Kill them? But Jesus defeated death. But if they died, they would be with Jesus. Paul actually wrote, for me to live is Christ. To die would be a gain. That was his perspective. So not only did the singing give them, I think, a kind of strength and solidarity to endure the trials and challenges and persecution that was ahead of them, but maybe it also gave them the vision. The vision to face the hard things because they know the resurrection is in front of them. To know that no matter what, wherever they go, God will be there. I wonder what it would be like to enter into worship with the desire and expectation that God would meet us. And not just meet us, but God would give us strength. (laughs) That we would experience solidarity. And that God might give us the vision to face whatever it is we're navigating in life. That God would lift us up and we would experience this kind of closeness with Christ that we're really longing for. I mean, what would it look like to enter into worship that way? Maybe we would hold our hands open, ready to receive. Maybe we would kneel down, recognizing that God is powerful, that God is strong. Maybe we would hold hands with people in the congregation, knowing that we are in this together. That I can borrow your song and you can borrow my song and we can sing this together even when we don't feel like it. I want to invite you as we move out of this teaching into worship. Ask this morning, ask God this morning what what it would look like for you to enter into worship 
with the desire and expectation that God would give you strength and solidarity and vision. What would God have you do? Maybe you carve out time in your week to worship and dance. Maybe you listen to worship music on your walk through the neighborhood. What, what might you do to enter into worship with that desire and expectation? Let me say a prayer for us. God, I, I ask that however, um, whoever's listening responds, whether it be they just sit in, in a moment of silence after this, or they continue to pray and seek and ask you what that would look like, or they spend time in worship, I pray that you would meet them in a mighty way, God, that you would remind them of who you are and give them strength to face what they are navigating in life. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. There is a river where goodness flows. There is a fountain that drowns sorrows. There is an ocean deeper than fear. The tide is rising, rising, bursting, bursting up from the ground. We feel it now, bursting, bursting. Up from the ground, we feel that now we come alive in the river. 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 There is a current stirring deep inside It's overflowing from the heart of God The flood of heaven crashing over us The tide is rising, rising Bursting, bursting up from the ground We feel it now Bursting, bursting up from the ground we feel it now we come alive in the river 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 break open prison doors set all the captives free spring up a well Spring up a well, spring up a well in me. Bursting, bursting up from the ground, we feel it now. Bursting, bursting up from the ground, we feel it now. Come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. Love is devoted like a 
rain of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rains Beyond the horizon Merciful today Faithful you have been Faithful you will be Pledge yourself to me And that's why I sing Your praise will ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips Your praise will ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips Your praise will ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips Your praise will Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips Father, the offer Your kindness makes us whole Your shoulder our weakness your strength becomes our own You're making me like you Clothing me in white Bringing beauty from ashes But you will have your bride Free of all her guilt Rid of all her shame And known by her true name that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Will be praised. Will be praised. Angels and saints, we sing, worthy are you. Please hear 
Shaking up the earth and skies 